We are going to be hitting Acts chapter 28 today, and Acts 28 is the last chapter in Acts, so I think we're just going to start it back over next week. Now, we are going to do some, uh, some different things a little bit. Obviously, we love teaching inside and out, and, and sometimes God doing the verse-by-verse -verse thing because a lot of people don't know it inside and out, and, and sometimes God reveals different things to different people, and so you get different aspects, and it's just really cool and, and fun, I think. Um, and, uh, but then there's also times where God is bringing specific word to us, you know, and wants to reveal different things or, or um, you know, kind of get into what he's doing in the moment. And so we're probably going to take a little bit of time and just kind of um, teach on things that God has been pouring into us even during this. And that's always fun. I, I love doing that myself. But um, let's kind of catch the setting of where we are right now. Obviously, I don't know if that's picking up there. Does it kind of sound echoey? That, you might have got to check. One, two, check. And I will tell you, this is my fault. I told James that I would be in here early today to make sure that my mic was set up. And I got in here right when Brittany was starting worship yet again. So that's completely my fault. That sounds a lot better. Can you all still hear me in the back? Perfect. Excellent job, James. Thank you. So the, the setting is this. Dr. Luke and Paul are traveling to Rome, right? They're going to Italy, but the whole purpose of that is because Paul is wanting to appeal his case to the emperor. The emperor at this time is Caesar Nero. Fortunately, he's not quite the psychopath yet toward the Christians that he's going to be. So we had talked before, if Paul really knew that Nero's going to lose his mind as much as he did to the Christians, would he actually be going? It, and, you know, it's probably like pre-Holocaust, uh, a Jew saying that they wanted to go have a face-to-face -face with, with Hitler. He's also under guard of an imperial regiment centurion named Julius. You did a, a great job covering Julius last week, or, or on the 27th, uh, chapter 27. And it, isn't it weird, though, that, like you said, all these centurions, these are, are Roman leaders that are over a hundred different men, at least. A little bit later on, it turned into 80. I don't know, maybe they just weren't doing a great job with that extra 20 or something. But they're, they're in charge of these hundred people. You know, so they've been, they've been chosen for their, their job because they are responsible. They're good leaders, whatever. Well, you see Paul through Acts here. By the time he gets into this first big fight with the, um, with the religious leaders and stuff, he's starting to have uh, conversations with centurions. And they're taking him and they're, you know, arresting him and all this stuff, whatever. But it seems like the centurions do give him a little bit of a break, and, and maybe they like him, whatever, I don't know. But uh, we're going to kind of unpack a little bit of Paul's relationship with Julius as we go along. Now, his, his relationship with, with Julius thus far seems pretty decent. I mean, you know, we, we know that Paul's like, hey, we probably shouldn't leave right now. Because it is after, uh, you know, September, October, we know, we know that uh, sailing at this point in time is really pretty ridiculous. I get that you want to go, but it's just my two cents. And Julia says, duly noted, I'm listening to the owner of the ship and the captain anyway. We're going to keep rolling because I don't think you know what you're talking about. They were in a ship. It was a big ship because we know that it was carrying uh, Paul 
and Dr. Luke and Julius and 273 other souls aboard this ship. That's a pretty good sized ship, you know, a big wooden boat. So, if it was going to be that big, and looking at all the stops that they were going to make, it was probably a trading vessel. So it probably wasn't like an actual ordained uh, Roman warship or something like that. It was, it was probably a training vessel. They used to jump in and, and take rides uh, wherever they needed to go whenever they wanted to go there. So they're on the Mediterranean Sea, and this is after Yom Kippur. Um, Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. Rod had talked about that. But what's so interesting is we just went through Yom Kippur just recently. And right now is the first time, 2024, that the nation of Israel has actually been in war during Yom Kippur since their uh, reestablishment of a country in 47-48. So I do think that that's pretty significant with what we're going through today and stuff. And as we read through this, whenever we're reading through the Word, we're reading through the Bible, and we get to pick up on these little things that, that kind of pop out at, at us too. And everything that we do uh, in our lives, if we're trying to relate it back to the Word of God, we should be able to pick up on these things. And so whenever you read Day of Atonement in Acts chapter 28, just understand that it's Yom Kippur and what's going on. And, and the reason that they're in war right now is because on Yom Kippur last year is whenever the terrorists tried to... Uh, attack them and, and take a bunch of their people into, you know. So Paul, uh, we know that he had this, this dream, right? He has this dream where he's visited by an angel of God. But he says it's an angel of God to whom I belong and I serve. So keep in mind that, that where they are and the people that they're talking to, these guys had all kinds of gods, they, they worshipped anything and everything. They would carve things to look like a God, and so they worshipped. He's like, I had a dream. An angel visited me, and it's from the one true God, who I believe in and I serve. I belong to this God. And it was a singular God. They, you know, they had all different kinds of gods, but this is just the one. And at the time, they're like... Well, he did tell us not to go, you know, but that was probably coincidence. But Paul goes on and he says, listen, I had this dream. You guys haven't eaten in a couple weeks. He probably hadn't eaten, eaten in a couple weeks. There, it says that it was 14 days that they're under extreme um, weather. They're under extreme um, danger, too. Tim, you were in the Navy. Like, is it, is it typical to go 14 solid days without seeing the sun or the moon out on the ocean? No, this was, this was wild. Pretty, pretty out of the ordinary experience going on here. And they didn't have the luxury of floating around on a, on a giant steel ship that wasn't going to sink, right? They're on a wooden boat. And things are getting really, really bad. But Paul's like, hey, listen... He, and I just see him. He's breaking this bread. It says he breaks this bread and he eats. And he's telling them, hey, you guys should eat too. He's, and he starts to eat. And they all start to eat and stuff. And he tells them, listen, none of you are going to die if you just pay attention to what I say. You know, not even a hair on your head is going to perish. I'm like, really, Paul? Thanks a lot. But when things get real bad, and this ship's about to come apart. We know that the Romans, their practice was to kill the slaves so that they wouldn't themselves be put to death. So they tell old Julius, they're like, hey, let's kill all these, these slaves, or these uh, prisoners, not slaves, so that, that things will go okay for us. He says, no, we're not going to do that. And some of the soldiers, though, a little bit later, they start lowering... Uh, down this raft, and they're going to try to leave, you know? And, and it even talks about how they're, like, being all sketchy about it. You know, they're trying to do-do-do. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. I see what you're doing over there. You have to stay here, or, or we're not going to live. 
you know? And so <laughs> Julius is like, cut the ropes. Y'all are staying right here, which is really cool that Julius finally at this part is like, I guess we'll start listening to Paul a little bit more. So the boat runs ashore, you know, it breaks apart. You have people that can swim, people that can't swim. And so Julius is like issuing out orders and these guys are, are helping the ones that can't swim to float on the broken pieces and stuff. And, and they see this, this shore and it says that, that they saw the shoreline and they didn't really recognize it, right? These guys, they're sailors. They're always sailing out there, but they had to go around the lee of Crete. Crete is this, is this island right there. So you've got, if we're looking at a big map, you've got Israel here, you know, Egypt, Israel, Rome is way up here. Crete is like right, right here. And normal, the straightest route up there is to just go on the other side, but they go on the east side of the island. And so they didn't even, they didn't even recognize the island that they were coming up to, Malta. And so um, as everything's like breaking apart and, and it's cold and it's windy, have you guys, I mean, recently we had this crazy uh, uh, hurricane, right? All up on the East Coast and everything. Florida got slammed again and everything. This is a little bitty island. They didn't have the kind of structures that we have today. It, it would have been pretty wild to be part of this group. But it says, once we were safe on shore... We learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. Whenever I first started reading this, I'm like, it's cold, it's rainy, let's make a fire outside. I'm like, that's not very nice. They're, they're all nice, but they're not taking you inside. And then I'm like, oh yeah, there was 276 people. So where are we going to put all these people? So everybody's gathering up firewood, right? It says, as Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. Now this shows Paul's servant heart. It really does. Paul... He is, yes, he's a, he's a prisoner, kind of, at this point. He's the one that appealed to Caesar, though, you know. But think about the condition that Paul's in right now. So, well, before we even get into that, let me read Philippians 1.27 to you. Paul says in that, he says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. So everywhere that Paul is going, he's trying to display Christ to people. He's trying to serve people. That's exactly what he's doing. Philippians 2.3 says, he's speaking to the, uh, the people of Philippi, and he says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress us out only for your own interests, but to others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Then listen to this last one. You must have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. And he's living out this example. He just was shipwrecked, you know? And he's going out and collecting this stuff. But in verse 4 it says, The people of the island saw this snake hanging from his hand and said to each other, A murderer, no doubt. I don't know what their accent was. It probably wasn't like that. But, <laughs> though he escaped the sea, the goddess Justice will not permit him to live. So as I'm looking through this stuff, you know, they established a really quick opinion of him. He got shipwrecked. Now he just got bit by a poisonous snake. This dude, he's no good. Stay away from this guy. It's, uh, it's not going to work out well for him. Now, out of all the things that's going on in Paul's life, he's just crawling out of the sea. He just gets bit by a snake. He's, he's gone through so much, but he's a true follower of Christ Jesus, and still he's not exempt from trials and tribulations. He's doing exactly what God's called him to do, going exactly where God had told him to go, step by step, 
and look at all the junk that's happening to him. Wouldn't you be like, clearly, I didn't hear you right. Certainly, I must be not doing what you wanted me to do. I must be hearing the voices in my head. But no, that's simply not the case, guys. When we're doing what God's called us to do, we're still going to have issues. We're still going to have trials. But look at the things that are coming out of these trials. People, he's trying to show them Jesus, and he's telling them Jesus, and he's proving to them Jesus. And God takes beauty from ashes. God gives him this dream before a massive disaster. And he's able to tell them, God said that we're all going to live. Boom. Now they're on, the, they're on the beach. They're all alive. Unbelievable. He gets bit by a snake. And it's clearly a poisonous snake. But as I'm studying all of this, people, these, these people today are trying to say, uh, not people today, theologians are trying to say, um, well, it, it couldn't have been a poisonous snake. It must have been a, a cat snake like they have on the islands today, which um, they're saying technically these cat snakes that are on the island of Malta right now, they have venom in their teeth, but the teeth are so far back in their throat that it, it wouldn't hurt a human, right? And so they're trying to make up excuses. Well, there was never a snake like that. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen somebody like get bit by a garter snake or something and, and you just all of a sudden think they're going to swell up and die from a non-venomous snake? Like, oh, it, it was a black snake. They're probably going to know. Like, they would have known. They would have had plenty of experiences if they thought that when he got bit, he was going to instantly swell up and die. It had to have been a poisonous snake, right? But look at Paul. This dude, he's this true servant of Christ. And he's gone through so much stuff. He still goes out and collects firewood and everything. What, what were the things... Like somebody said, his back probably looked like a, uh, a walnut shell. And I started thinking about that. Anybody know what, what a walnut shell looks like after the, after the skin of it's off and stuff? It's, I mean, it's really rough. But when you consider why they would have made that statement, in Deuteronomy 25, 1 through 3, he says that the Jewish law, the max number that they can, they can whip somebody with a cat of nine tails, is 39 times, right? And we know that it shredded the flesh off of Christ's body. We get a pretty clear description of that. Paul was beat that way Five times. Five separate times. I'm not saying five lashes one time. I'm saying 39 stinking lashes five separate times. He was beat with rods by the Romans three times. He was shipwrecked, floating around out at sea multiple times. He was stoned to death. I say to death, I think the dude died and God brought him back. But if it wasn't dead, it was super, super, super close to dead. I complain that my body hurts whenever I get out of bed in the morning um, because of the things I've done to it. This dude, oh my goodness, he has to hurt way worse than me. And he's still going out and still serving people. He's not stopping because of his passionate love for Jesus Christ, for what God has done to him. Why would he endure something like this over and over and over again? Philippians 1.20 says, For I fully expect and hope I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past, and I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For me, living means uh, living for Christ, and dying is even better. So he's doing this. He says right there, the whole reason that he does this, and he's, he's suffering, and he will not stop, is to bring honor to Christ. 
How many of us have that kind of motivation? That kind of dedication, determination? Man, I don't, I mean, I would love to say that I could handle that. But think of the second time that he's getting ready to get whipped. The 39 times. Think of the second time. It's already happened once and he knows what he's getting ready to go through. Imagine being strapped to that pole and getting whipped the next almost 70 times, you know? And then he goes right back to doing what got him there in the first place and gets it again. I mean, that's amazing. Philippians 1.29 says, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for Him. The privilege of suffering for Him. God, help me to view suffering for you truly as a privilege. Acts 20, verse 24 says, but my, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. That's the point. To him, his life is worth nothing if he's not doing what God told him to do. Whether he's getting whipped or not. Whether he's chained to a Roman or not. How could he live like this? Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So this is how, how Paul views things. This is how he goes into things, how he lives his life. He says, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. He has done. Thank him for everything that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That's how it's done. That's how it's done. So what brought him to all of this suffering, right? His message. What he wouldn't stop saying is what brought him all of this. He's saying what God told him to say. Acts 20, 21 says... I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike. The necessity of re repenting from sins and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. That's the message that he's been having. However, like you said the other day, Rick, it's, it's absolutely true that just talking about Jesus wasn't necessarily so much of what really made them want to murder this dude. But it was the fact that he says, it's not just for you Jews anymore, it's also for the Gentiles. And they're like, what? Kill him. <laughs> you know? Um, we'll see that a little bit more here in, in just a minute. So Paul gets bit by this snake, right? And he shakes it off into the fire and was unharmed. I love it. He didn't freak out. He didn't scream. At least it's not recorded. You know. Boom. Snake stuck to his hand and he's like. Shakes it off in the fire. Me. I mean I'm not really afraid of snakes. But if it latched onto my hand I probably. Wah! <laughs> like, it wouldn't hit the fire. Unless the fire was really big and way over there somewhere. <laughs> you know. But he, didn't, he also didn't blame others. For not gathering wood. You don't hear that at all. He wasn't like, well, I got bit by a snake. What were you guys doing? Am I the only one going to gather the wood? Am I the only one that's going to work in the ministry? Am I the only one that's going to, you know, try to bring souls to Christ? No. He wasn't complaining about that. He wasn't blaming other people. He didn't blame God for letting it happen to him. He didn't say, seriously, God, I'm doing exactly what you called me to do. And yet again, I got a snake stuck to my hand. No, he didn't. He just shook it off and let it fall in the fire. This thing that's trying to attack him while he's doing God's work. He just shook it off 
and let it fall in the fire where it belongs. He didn't let it bother him. And he trusted the fact that he's doing what God's told him to do, where he's told him to do it, when he's told him to do it, how he's told him to do it. So even if a poisonous viper stuck to his hand, guess what? God said you're going to Rome. Why do you need to worry about the snake that just bit you? God didn't say, on your way to Rome, you're going to die by being bit by a poisonous viper. No, he said, you're, you will stand before Caesar. So he's like, okay, God said I'm going, so it's not that big of a deal. He was walking in the security of God's direction. These people, they waited. In verse 6 it says, the people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. You know, uh, it, the word is truth. People are trying to explain it away. So it must not have been a poisonous life or whatever. The word is true. If it says it's a poisonous viper, it's a poisonous viper. It's not an allegory. It says, but when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and they decided he must be a god. <laughs> well, poisonous viper didn't kill him, must be a god. Let's worship this guy now. Add him to the list. Well, listen. Paul wasn't a criminal, and he wasn't a god. They were wrong on both accounts. So whenever they're wrong on both accounts, I want to tell you guys, be careful to not allow what others say of you, whether it's good or bad. Just because somebody else says it, don't let it go to your heads. Don't let it go to your hearts. If somebody says, oh, you're a horrible person, you don't have to take that. You don't. You don't have to even defend yourself. But don't let it stick in your head. Don't start acting like a horrible person just because somebody else has that opinion of you. And don't let it go to your heart and be like, well, it didn't kill me. Maybe I am a god. You know? Good, bad. What other people say of you don't, does not define you. What God says of you defines you. And he says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He says that he has a plan for you. He loves you. He made you exactly how you are. Put you exactly where you are, when you are. He knew you were going to be sitting in here today. When I was being an absolute moron, not deserving even to probably live if you really break it down, he still knew that I was going to be standing here today redeemed, Renewed, set free, restored, and covered in the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Good thing I'm not God. I wouldn't have made it very long. So now, now the plot thickens, right? And again, I'm thinking, what's Julius thinking? Paul was right about the shipwreck. Paul gets bit like... He's still alive. There must be something up with this guy, right? So they're near, near the shore where we, landed, where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. That means that he was Rome's direct representative. His house was right there. And it says that he welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. I think that Paul and probably Luke and... Hey, what was that other dude's name that was with him? Never mind. Yes, yes. Another weird, crazy Greek name or something. He probably lets them stay in the house. I'm sure Julius did too because he's like, he's not staying in here if I'm not. You know, it's wet and cold out there. But it says that he treated them really well for three days. And then it, hap it just so happened that, that this dude's father was ill with fever and dysentery. That's not good, you know. Um, that can kill a lot of people, but supposedly there was like a, um, some worms that were known on that island through some things that they ate, and it would make people like ridiculously sick. If it didn't kill them, they'd be sick for months and months and months with some of these exact same things. So maybe that's what happened. But one way or another, he had fever, dysentery, could have killed him. But Paul went in and prayed for him, and laying his hands on him, he healed him. 
Well, what happens whenever somebody gets healed like that, just out of clear blue, right? People start coming out of the woodwork for healing. So, it says, Then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. As a result, we were shown, or we were showered with honors, and when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we could need for the trip. They also had Dr. Luke with them, right? So, um, I believe, personally, that they were all healed. That everybody that came to him were healed. But some commentators say, well, Dr. Luke was with them, and maybe they were just given aid for their illnesses. I'm like, goodness gracious, people. Can you not just take the word for the word? <laughs> like, read something else if you don't believe it. Like, goodness gracious. That's probably not a good uh, attitude to have, is it? I'll work on that. But God did the work, and Paul was obedient. Like, Paul didn't heal these people, but he was obedient, and he did what God told him to do. So he lays his hands on them, prays for them, boom, they get healed. That's awesome. What's Julius thinking now? Though? <laughs> now he sees that this dude's walking in some power that even he doesn't have, controlling a hundred different Roman soldiers. Julius can't lay his hands on people and then be healed. He's probably been in battle and watched his buddies die right there in front of him, I would imagine. So then we're moving on to verse 11, and Paul arrives in Rome. That's what it was titled, so I just read it that way. But it was three months after the ship wrecked that we set sail on another ship. So I'm thinking Paul's probably like, hey, can we just wait it out now? I mean, this, can, can we just wait until <laughs> it gets better? So it was three months. After that shipwreck, and they set sail on another ship that had wintered at the island, an Alexandrian ship with the twin gods, which was Castor and Pollux, as its figurehead. So I, I, whenever I hear that, it, I'm like, I bet somebody's going to find that ship sooner or later. Because why would, they, why would Luke take the time to list out exactly who they were if we're not going to find it? And we've been finding stuff like crazy to prove the Bible. So I think that we probably will. But when, in my mind, I'm, I'm seeing this. And a ship with the big figureheads on it reminds me of like a, a Viking ship, you know. And that's probably something very similar to what it was. Um, they take off on that. But God had given them three months of rest. He's like, you've been through a lot, guys. <laughs> We're going to let you chill for a little bit. But it says, on our first stop, uh, our first stop was Syracuse, where we stayed three days. So remember, they're pulling into these ports. They're probably offloading goods and stuff and picking up more stuff. But they stayed in Syracuse three days. Something that I found super, super interesting about Syracuse is that Syracuse was the home of Archimedes, which was the famous mathematician. Any mathematicians in here? I can't raise my hand on that one, but any? Anyway, if, if you know anything about math, this dude was a very famous mathematician. And when the Romans conquered the island, a soldier came up and put a dagger to Archimedes' throat as he was working on a math problem, drawing the math problem in the dirt. Apparently, he didn't have a chalkboard. Archimedes said, stop, you're disturbing my equation. And then the soldier killed him. So I was like, wow, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that before. But... I don't know. I'm probably taking you down a rabbit trail that you're like, this guy's head is everywhere. Moving on to verse 13. From there we sailed across to some other place. A day later, a south wind began blowing. So the following day, we sailed up the coast to Put yeah, some other place. There we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came... And so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came to meet us at the forum on the Appian Way. So, Rod, you had hit this a little bit, the fact that they came all the way down there. Uh, others joined us at the three taverns. Mine, mine says taverns for whatever reason. Then Paul saw them, and he was very encouraged and thanked God. So, these people, as, as Paul's getting up there, you know, the weather's breaking, travel's finally starting to happen again, and word gets up to Rome that Paul's coming. 
Well, about four years earlier, Paul wrote the book called Romans, the letter to the Romans. They're hearing that. They probably feel like they already kind of know this guy. You know, he's probably already mentored them a little bit. And, um, and, so, and also, Christians were in Rome from the beginning. If you read Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 20, whenever Peter's preaching at Pentecost, the Roman Christians were some that were listed in that. So the word had gotten all the way up there, and people already believed in Christ at that point. So it wasn't brand new. But these guys, they walked at least 43 miles. We think 43 miles, no big deal. You know, 60 miles an hour, you're going a mile to get down there. But they walked 43 miles to get down there. This is like a, a, the way they would welcome an emperor. Like they, they really were honoring him by walking down there. But a while back, I asked, uh, I asked Rod because I was listening to a lot of common, uh, commentaries and reading a lot about uh, Paul and this time frame. And I said, so did he die at the end of this two years? Because we know that he's in Rome for two years. We know that he got his head cut off. Uh, and then so Paul's like, or Rod's like, I don't know, like you're going to have to look into it for yourself, which I'm glad to do that because I love doing it. But if you start digging into his other letters and stuff, during Paul's second imprisonment in Rome, so he was imprisoned a second time, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 16, Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, the first time I was brought before the judge, everyone abandoned me except for Luke. So, that lets us know, yes, he was at this time that we're reading here in Acts. He, he was in prison this first time. He wasn't, obviously wasn't found guilty. He gets out. I don't know what he did after that. Probably wrote some more letters, whatever. But then he was in prison the second time, and that second time is whenever he got his head chopped off. But he talks about in 2 Timothy how everybody left him. So right now we're seeing him come in town. And he's getting this fanfare. I mean, people are just coming and they're, they're like, yes, Ken. Paul's here. This is great. But by the time of his second trial, nobody was with him. And I don't know why, but here at the end of Acts chapter 28, it just kind of seems like Luke's like, well, I'm done writing. I got a hand cramp or something. And he just stops. It does. It just stops. You're like, where's the rest? So, I don't know, I'm probably going to ask him that whenever I get to heaven. Like, hey, you know, it'd been, it would have been beneficial to have a little bit more, you know? Inquiring minds would like to know what really happened. So, anyway, it says, when we arrive, um, in verse 16, when we arrived in Rome, Paul, had, um, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. They're like, look, we're not going to spend tax money on you any more than we have to. You can rent your own place, but you have to rent it yourself. And this guard's going to be chained to you the whole time. They, they got chained to him for four hours at a time. They were relieved every four hours. Paul didn't get that relief. So he had this captive audience all the time. But remember who brought him there? It was the Imperial Guard, and now he's in Rome. And you know that the soldiers that are in Rome are the best because that's the headquarters, right? So he's talking to people that have influence with the emperor, with his family. They probably uh, are constantly in communication with these very high ups. And so Paul is preaching directly to them all the time because that's clearly what he does, right? I love that he's got this captive audience. It says, three days after Paul's arrival, oh, and the place that he rented had to be pretty big because quite a few people come over here in just a little bit, and he had to pay for it himself. But three days after he gets there, he called together the local Jewish leaders, same as he always does, and they're always the ones that try to kill him. He's like, all right, I've been here three days. Let's do this. <laughs> like, bring it on, boys. I'm, just, I'm like, Paul, give it a minute. Settle in a little bit, you know, like build some relationships. He's like, no, 
I got something to do. I got to tell you something. Guess what? You're not going to like it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. He said to them, brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government. Even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors. When he's talking to these people, I'm pretty sure that Paul already believes that word had traveled there about him. Because people always followed him. When they knew where he was going, they followed him, they tried to ambush him, they tried to, you know, infiltrate the people that he's going to be talking to. So I'm sure that he thinks that they already know what's up. So he's, he starts right in on it. And these guys are sitting there listening, probably like, who are you? You know? I'll, you'll see why I think that. Even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, so against our people, the Jews, or the law. Those are the two main reasons that you're going to get yourself handed over to the Romans for some pretty significant punishment, obviously. He says, the Romans tried me and wanted to release me because they found no cause for the death sentence. Obviously, the Jews are like, kill that dude. We don't want him around anymore. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, so they're like, he didn't do anything wrong. These Jewish leaders are all kinds of upset, and they protested. It says, when they protested the decision, I felt that it was necessary to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. He says, I felt it necessary because if they let me go, I would have been murdered. It's like, listen, all you guys with all the armor and the swords and the training and the horses and everything, you're the only thing keeping me alive right now. I'm pretty positive of that. So I appeal to Caesar. I'm going to stay in your custody on my own accord, even though you want to let me go. That's a gutsy move. It's a gutsy move going to the Jewish leaders like he always did. I'll tell you that right now. He says, I asked you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. The only reason I'm in chains is because I personally believe that the guy we're waiting for has already come. They replied. So this, at this point, I'm thinking, they're looking at him like, who are you? Like, I, I, don't, I literally don't even know why you're here. They replied, we had no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here. Nobody said you were coming. But we do want to hear what you believe, for the only thing we know about this movement is that it, it is denounced everywhere. I want to hear what you have to say because literally nobody believes it. So... I, they were just interested, right? I think that a big part of the reason that they hadn't heard from anybody is one, everybody probably thought that he was dead. Okay, they expected him to have gone up there. I'm sure that they were thinking that, um, that he would have been there by now, but if he's on a, a big trader ship, Right, like we had talked about. And this ship wrecks months ago, a long time ago, before the bad weather. We know people aren't traveling. The, these people that are accustomed to being comfortable, they're not traveling. You know, they're like, uh, it wouldn't make sense for me to go land all the way around. And it's not wise to go through the sea. We're going to wait it out, let him get there, whatever. Then we'll, we'll deal with it. Then all of a sudden, what happens whenever a big uh, ship wrecks? You get stuff strewn everywhere, stuff starts washing up on the shore. I'm sure people identified the stuff that these guys started throwing over whenever it got really bad. And so they probably get, um, they get word back that, hey, all this stuff's washing up on shore. We know that it came from this ship. We know that Paul was on that ship. He's probably dead. We haven't heard from anybody saying that, they, that they're alive or anything like that. So they, they literally probably thought that he was dead. So they didn't send anybody. So a time was set, it says in verse 23, so a time was set 
And on that day that the time was set, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. So he's probably renting a pretty big place. That's why, why I was saying that. A large num number of people came there. Now, before we, before we go too far into this, and Paul starts uh, his discussion and he's explaining what's going on, I want to set an anchor point for you. Paul is, is, what you're getting ready to read is very interesting because Paul's always pointing out that Jesus is the Messiah through the Old Testament. Always. We point out that he's the Messiah through the New Testament a lot. He's pointing it out through the Old Testament. But Isaiah 6, 8 Isaiah 6, verse 8, says, Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I'm going to open up to Isaiah real quick. Paul is going. And Paul's saying the things that God wants him to say. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? And who will go for us? And God goes on talking there in Isaiah about the destruction, the things that were going to happen, all these, these horrible things, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us off course for just a second, but I think that it's... it's Really interesting and, and neat to understand. Then in Isaiah 6, 11, so just a little bit farther down, it said, Then I said, Lord, how long will this go on? Isaiah is asking God, this destruction is horrible. How long is this going to go on? Listen to this. Until their towns are empty, their houses are deserted, and the whole country is a wasteland until the Lord has sent everyone away and the entire land of Israel lies deserted. So now we're back. I'm, I'm taking you back to Paul. And in 70 AD, so after Paul's in Rome here, in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple to the ground. Literally, and destroyed it. I mean, you're like, you can't burn stone. Yes, but they knocked it all down. Like, no stone was left on top of itself. And Israel was dispersed until May 14th, 1948, whenever it became a country again. So, that was, that was over in Isaiah. And he's talking about how it's going to be destroyed. But he says, but as a tabernacle or an oak tree leaves a stump when it is cut down, so Israel's stump will be a holy seed. And that holy seed starts to reproduce. And on May 14, 1948, Israel became a country again. Thank God. So, we're back. Um, so just recap real quick. Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom will I send and who um, will go for me as a messenger to these people? Right? Then we look at Acts chapter 9, verse 15. And the Lord says to Ananias, But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as the people of Israel. God said, Who, Who's going to go for me? And then God says, I choose Paul at this time. You know, yes, Isaiah went before, but he chooses Paul at this time to literally go and bring his message forth. So, now Paul is in his apartment talking to these guys, still chained to the Roman soldier over here. So I bet he talked with his hands too. So he's like, ching, the soldier's like, would you stop already? You know, that's, that's where my mind goes. 
It says, He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets. He spoke to them from morning until evening. And if Paul can preach from morning until evening, we're going to be here a while. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to keep you until evening. Steve's like, I'm going to throw something at you. I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> Don't do it, Steve. But he's preaching them. He's using something that they know. They just don't understand it fully yet. They think they understand because it's been taught to them this way forever. It's always been presented like this. But now he's saying, yes, I know you, you believe it's this. It's Jesus. Here's how. Here's why. Look at this. It says, some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. Before I get into this final word, it said some believed. And some will believe you when you share the gospel. Whenever you share the good news, your testimony of what God's done to you and for you. Whenever you share your experiences and whenever you share the fact that he is the one true God. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's the one that can save them from their sins. Some will listen, some won't. A lot of people didn't listen to Jesus. A lot of people didn't listen to Paul. But some did. And because of that, we're still talking about it today, and we believe, and we have relationship with him today. And I encourage you, keep it up, because people way down the road are going to be talking about Jesus having a relationship with him and loving him because of you. So, it says, after they had argued back and forth amongst themselves, I don't think Paul was, was really digging this very much. He doesn't like, the arguing is really getting on his nerves, it sounds like. So I call this throat punch Thursday. I don't know if it was Thursday, but he's getting ready to hit him in the throat, it seems like. And he says, the Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet. He's getting ready to lay it down. You know, I don't know the tone of voice that he's using, but he's getting ready to really smack him. He says, go and say this to this people. When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear. Here's a big, a big takeaway right here. And they have closed their eyes. They have closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. He's right there. Just open your eyes, open your ears, open your heart, because God wants to heal us. And Paul isn't upset with these people because they've brutally tortured him. He's upset because he knows what they're losing out on, what they're missing out on. And so whatever he's telling them about Christ and pointing it out, proving it letter by letter by letter, laying out the Old Testament, you know this. This is, you studied it your whole lives. I'm proving to you that Jesus is the Messiah. It's crushing him. You don't keep going and get brutally tortured and have your flesh ripped off your body time and time again just because you want to prove a point. No, it's because you passionately love people. And God says the greatest two commandments are to love me and to love others. And Paul is loving others. And so it's crushing him to know you are refusing this relationship with the one that created you. And it not only breaks his heart, it's breaking my heart. It's devastating to him. He was healed from the same junk 
that they're stuck in. He was going out and persecuting Christians. He would have gladly taken a whip to these Christians. But he was healed from that. His eyes were open. And he's like, open your stinking eyes. It's right here. The truth's right in front of your face. But they couldn't hear it. They wouldn't hear it. They wouldn't see it. If you look at John chapter 12, verses 27 through 23, it proves this point really well. I'll read it. You don't have to flip there, but you can. John 12, 27 through uh, 32. I, I think I said 23, didn't I? My dyslexia kicked in. It's like you're going backwards. So we're going to read. No. Sorry. I was deeply troubled. 12, 27 through 32. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I, and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus is speaking this. My soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason that I came. Father, bring your glory. Bring glory to your name. Father, bring glory to your name. And then, it says, Then a voice spoke from heaven, saying, I have already brought glory to my name, and I will do it again. When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to him. People, some people understood. Some people heard clearly, but other people thought that it was thunder. Why is that? They're standing in the same place. They can hear it, but they can't comprehend it. It says, Jesus said, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. Jesus knew exactly what he said. He's talking to the people now that heard the voice, that understood what he said. He said, this was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come. It has come. So when people tell you the world hasn't been judged, he says it has come. The time has come. And when I am lifted up from the earth... So most people believe that that's whenever he was raised up on the cross. I will draw everyone to myself. We, you know, we, we think that it's our responsibility for people's salvation. And it's not our responsibility for people's salvation. It's not up to you if they accept Christ or not. It's only your responsibility to lift him up, to magnify him, to glorify him, to present him. To show him to people, there is a Messiah. He does love you. He wants to save you. Repent. Come to him. Turn from your sins. Come to him. That's your responsibility. If they say yes, great. If they say no, well, that's not your responsibility. He says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people unto myself. So back in Acts 28, 28, he says, So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. So he just, you know, he hit him pretty hard, saying, Listen, Isaiah was talking about you people. And then he drives, drives the knife in and says, Because you don't listen God is offering it to the Gentiles now. Congratulations. And now we get to have it. And he says, and they will accept it. And I do accept it. And you've accepted it. That's awesome. Then it goes on and it says, for the next two years. Oh, well, before I hit that, keep in mind, as he's saying this about Isaiah, and he's talking to them, they were just in this big argument, you know, people that believe, people that don't believe. And as they're leaving... Is whenever Paul's hitting them with this. Some of them are just walking out the door. You know, they're like, I'm done with this. But then it says, for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. Two years straight. On day three, 
he met with the religious leaders of the time. <laughs> Everywhere else, they're like, kill that dude. But nobody tried to stop him, probably because he was chained to a Roman soldier. I don't know. But then it stops. That's the end of Acts. That's the end of the book of Acts. <laughs> nobody tried to stop him for those two years. But there were a few things that I wanted to hit um, with you guys, too, as we're wrapping up. I'll make this really quick. It's Acts 20, verse 24. Here it is. Is remember that he said that his life is worth nothing to him unless he uses it for finishing the one work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. He said that he has a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world to educate and um, to the educated and the uneducated. Paul, that's, that's what was pushing this dude. That's what was driving him was this sense that God had called him to do this and he knew that he had to do it. In Philippians 1.20, he says, For I fully expect past, that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know... Which is better? I'm torn between the two. Uh, I'm torn between these two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. Yes, it would be. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. That is not a proud statement. He sees the, the, uh, the despair that they live in. He sees their life without the hope of Christ as their salvation. So he says, it's better for you that I live. Knowing this, I'm convinced that I will remain alive so I continue, so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. Guys, that's where we need to be. If we're not dead yet, if we haven't taken the last breath here and the first breath there, then we need to keep understanding that our job is to help people to grow and experience the joy of their faith. He says, Philippians 1, 27. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come to see you again or I only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith which is the good news. He goes on, he says, Don't be intimidated by any way. Um, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. This guy, like, he's laying it out for him, you know? And I, I just want to encourage all of you. If, if you see him go through all this stuff and he can continue on, you can continue on, okay? And... He's in paradise with God right now. That's pretty awesome. Even though he suffered like crazy. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything and tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, 
which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Amen. He's no longer a slave. He's no longer a prisoner. And he did fight the good fight. So, that's wrapping up Acts.